Welcome to one of Italy's most famous locations, home to one of the world's most incredible cities, founded over 1,600 years ago and built almost entirely on top of ancient wooden poles. This is Venice, and we're going to take you with us as we explore this fascinating location over a full week on board the only luxury river ship that sails here all year round, Uniworld's SS Lavanezia. We'll also explore Milan, Verona and Lake Como, and we're going to take you there with us right now. So, benvenuto and adiamo! Uniworld are the only large river cruise company with permission to dock overnight at the beautiful island of Burano, situated in the northern region of the lagoon. It's such a compact and pretty little isle, and that's what makes it our favourite. Stroll through this colourful island we like to dub Mini Venice, and you'll be forgiven for thinking you've stumbled on a film set, with its narrow canals winding through the streets of shops and houses, with their immaculate facades of pastel tones and bright pops of colour. Bring your camera, for it's an absolute haven for photography lovers. It is said that the colours of the houses allowed fishermen to spot them through the thick fog, common on the lagoon from November to February. The Fondamenta is what Venetians call a pedestrian path, which runs along a rio or a canal, and here in Burano you'll be eager to discover where the next one leads you. Many are flanked with cafes and shops, and many boast a common local speciality. Burano is also known as the Island of Lace, as lace makers perpetuate the historic art of weaving threads into delicate fabrics. There are many lace makers here who will proudly show off their art and, of course, sell you an item or two. After lunch, we headed out for yet another fascinating afternoon, starting with a half hour ride in a private shuttle boat to an island that is not as pretty but way more famous than its little sister Burano. Since the 13th century, the furnaces of the island of Murano have produced a quality of glass renowned throughout the world for its purity. Venice has always been a world centre for fine glass production, but in the 13th century, a decision was taken to move all production to Murano, the main reason being limiting the fire risk to one area of the lagoon. As you can imagine, a city made almost entirely of wood and randomly distributed and often unregulated furnaces was quite obviously a bit of a nightmare for the local firefighters. A Uniworld tour of a glass factory including a glass blowing demonstration is a fascinating introduction to the island's many vendors who will happily sell you anything from a glass bead for a few cents up to 150,000 euro hand blown glass sculptures and everything in between. Don't worry about room in your suitcase though they will be more than happy to ship worldwide, but just be careful of your local tax laws. Import duty is an easy win for your government and a painful additional cost for you. Back at the ship, the day was far from over. It seems like we'd packed so much into the morning and afternoon, it was time for a bit of a breather. Thankfully, the captain had it all figured out. As a generous gift to our weary legs, we embarked on a relaxing scenic sail from the top of the lagoon to the very bottom, a distance just short of 20 miles, to Chioggia. The evening was glorious and we headed up to Cielo's for a bit of al fresco dining. With the roof peeled back and a cool glass of white, this was the perfect way to relax into the sailing. While the pizzas were prepared and cooked fresh, we started with a tower of antipasti. There's no menu in Cielo's, so you can enjoy the antipasti while a selection of self-serve pizzas are being baked to perfection. It's a random selection and believe us, this talented chap keeps them coming all evening. Warning, a food coma after a visit to Cielo's is a real risk. 
So we've heard several times over the years, carbs don't count on a cruise. Being much more convenient than the truth, we 100% buy into that. Before we do Kyogia, here's a small tribute to the breakfasts on board. Honestly, every little item was thoughtfully prepared and beautifully presented. Helen and I don't normally eat breakfast unless they are super tempting. Yep, I succumbed. There was no way I was going to let this pass me by. I mean, just look at those donuts. Hold me back. Hold me back! In our opinion, a river cruise is not complete without a cycle ride through one of the locations visited, and this cruise was no different. Our cycling excursion through the southernmost and most historic location of Kyogia was enormous fun, and we enjoyed frequent stops as our guide told us the history of the area. This excursion was less about the location this time, and more about just having a bit of fun. We stopped halfway through our ride because we'd actually reached the Adriatic Sea. Typically, Helen had to dip her toes in. Some things just have to be done, she said. Good luck with biking back with wet feet, said I. As usual, my retorts were not a deterrent. After a quick lunch on board, it was time to climb aboard a really nice coach and head out for another stupendous included excursion, this time for a tour and wine tasting at the Dominio di Bagnoli wine estate. It took us around an hour to get there, but when we arrived, boy, it was worth the journey. With a couple of Bellinis safely dispatched, we headed to dinner. In the absence of a dining guide, I have to mention Rialto's, the main dining venue on board SS La Venezia. The menus are designed to reflect the cuisine of the region, and by golly, they hit the bullseye. There's Italian choices in abundance here, as well as the Uniworld classics if it all gets a bit overwhelming. The little LV logo on the tableware reminds you of Uniworld's flair for the little touches of uniqueness. We love that. Wines also stimulate the Italian senses, and it's all absolutely perfect. Here's what we enjoyed on this particular occasion.
In addition to the organised tours, there is ample time and opportunity to explore Venice by foot at your own pace. La Venezia's docking location is perfectly placed for a short stroll to the heart of the city. The district of San Marco, one of six neighbourhoods to explore, and the one that best embodies the spirit, architectural creativity and historic essence of the Serenissima. In fact, until the 19th century, it was only through San Marco that visitors like us entered the city. Today, however, we chose to rest our legs and take a water taxi from the port to the San Marco district as it was part of our Uniworld walking tour and besides, a water taxi is an ideal way to get a different view of your journey to the centre of the city and appreciate these waterways for what they are, which are effectively Venice's roads. Beware though, some of the bridges are a bit of a squeeze. In addition to the Grand Canal, which snakes through the centre of Venice, the Caraneggio Canal and the Guidecca Canal, which are the other major thoroughfares, there are a multitude of smaller waterways that form a labyrinth of 177 additional canals. The Venetians call these minor routes Rio, or Re in the plural, and these are best viewed from the multitude of bridges that cross them as gondolas weave their way through them to the delight of their tourist patrons. The gondolier is a profession born out of the need to navigate the city's network of canals over the centuries, meandering their shallow bottom boats carrying goods and produce to businesses and markets that in recent times have given way to excited visitors taking selfies. Today in Venice there are just over 400 gondoliers who are carefully trained and regulated to ensure the profession lives on to the highest standard. The pride they take in their gondolas is evidence enough that you should make time for a ride in one. A trip to Venice is also not complete without a trip to the Rialto Bridge and the adjacent historic Rialto Market. The bridge is the link between the district of San Marco, the centre of political power, and the economic centre surrounding the market. An ancient architectural feat, the Rialto Bridge spans the canal, 121 feet or 37 meters long, with a single massive arch. In 1264, a wooden bridge was built there on stilts. Later, shops, also built on stilts, were added to the sides. Tragedy struck, though, nearly 200 years later, when in 1444, the entire bridge collapsed under the weight of a crowd attending the wedding of the Marquis de Ferrara. Its stone replacement was completed in 1591, and this is the bridge that still stands today. Close by to the bridge, under the neo-Gothic arcades of the Loggia della Pescheria, built in 1907 by the architect Domenico Rupolo, the fish market is a fascinating place to stop and observe. The stalls here bring together the vegetables of Sant'Erasimo and the fish from the Adriatic Sea daily, and it's a wonderful sight to behold in such a historic setting. The market itself was established in the 11th century and it's best to visit in the early morning when the boats unload their goods in the morning silence onto the piers that still bear the name of the products once sold here. Riva del Vin, wine, del Carbon, coal, and del Oggio, oil. There are so many hidden gems as you meander through the city's network of fondamentas, such as the mesmerizing sunray clock of the Church of St. James of Rialto, which has kept time over this market district since the 12th century. A quick glance of your own more modern timepiece will tell you that it's time to return to the ship. And if you feel you've walked enough, pick up a Vaporetti, one of the city's numerous water buses that chug up and down the main canals and the city's only form of public transport. Alternatively, for a little more luxury, why not travel in style on one of the beautiful polished wood water taxis like we did earlier? We recommend you share one with friends though, as they are not cheap. Luckily for us, the return journey was also included in our Uniworld voyage. 
We were on board Uniworld's SS Lavanetia as part of a special founders cruise organised by the lovely people at Panache Cruises, our trusted travel partners and one of the most experienced companies out there for luxury cruising. If you're interested in any of their future founders cruises or want to know what they're all about, or if you like the look of this cruise or any other ultra luxury or luxury ocean cruise, river, expedition or yacht style cruise, please give them a call and tell them we sent you. If you mention Visit With Us, we'd be incredibly honoured and it will bring you some exclusive offers and incentives in the near future. Call one of these numbers now or visit their beautiful website to make your next bucket list cruise, like the one we've taken in Venice here, a reality. Thank you. If that's not a deep enough delve into one of Italy's most loved cultural centres, Uniworld also offered us a pre-cruise stay in Milan. And let's just say there's more than enough to tempt us into this two-night land extension. Let me show you how wonderful this was. We stayed in the heart of Milan in the Rosa Grand Hotel. This is Uniworld's preferred hotel, and it was just like their ships. Ornate, full of rich details, and of course, touches of luxury. And if you're in any doubt as to how central this hotel is, well... Milan Cathedral is almost next door. These two full days on land were packed with interest and adventure. Let us show you. On our first morning, we headed out early to the Santa Maria del Grazie Church and Convent to see something truly remarkable. The work of art we were going to be viewing is located in the dining room of the convent and was commissioned by Ludovico Sforza, Duke of Milan, and was believed to be completed between 1495 and 1498 by a little-known painter called Leonardo da Vinci. Have you heard of him? Seeing Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, one of the world's most renowned and mysterious works of art with your own eyes, and up close is something you're never ever likely to forget. Getting the opportunity to view this masterpiece is a unique experience, but tickets are extremely limited and must be booked months in advance. Luckily, Uniworld has it covered for you and you are ushered in, not as part of a huge noisy crowd like other ancient tourist attractions, but as a small quiet group. The only downside to this incredible experience is that you'll only have 15 minutes in front of the painting that's not much when it comes to observing one of the world's most famous works of art, not to mention one that has launched countless conspiracy theories, movies and novels. With your visit only being a short one and early in the morning, there's a huge benefit of having most of the day left to do something just as special, if a little different. But first, given it was still only around 9am, we embarked on a morning walking tour of Milan's most beautiful attractions in the company of our brilliant guide. Here's a selection of our favourite highlights.
After we returned to the hotel, there was just time to grab a panini for lunch on the go and then hop on a private coach that took us for a trip to Lake Como. Setting off at 12pm, we arrived at the lake and got on a boat for a scenic ride around the shores of the lake, taking in all the lakeside mansions of the rich and famous before stopping at the pretty town of Bellagio for an hour or so and for a wander around, stopping to grab a cheeky Aperol spritz on the waterfront while we watched the summer lake tourists wander by. last full day before boarding SS La Venezia was again a tale of two very different halves. We started out at 7am to get on this incredibly luxurious coach. I mean, it had these fully adjustable sports seats and a full power socket at each seat. It was taking us to Verona before the crowds arrived for a walking tour of this ancient city. Famous for two little-known teenagers who fell in love, much to the ire of their families, who were not impressed at all. You probably already know that it didn't end well for poor Romeo and Juliet. Our first stop was the actual balcony Juliet called out for Romeo. Then Romeo's house. Time in the square, followed by a walk to the amphitheatre, before back on the coach for the next part of our tour. Phew, these days are certainly packed. Let's be lovers tonight. Count the stars in our eyes Discover how they align Let's be lovers tonight And our day of treats did not stop there. Told you it was packed with quality experiences and what's coming next is no exception. Our next stop is lunch somewhere rather special. It's one of the most prestigious and historic Venetian estates with a tradition for winemaking going back more than 650 years. Serego Alighieri is a 14th century wine estate surrounded by the rolling hills of Valpolicella. The property was purchased in 1353 by the son of the poet Dante Alighieri, who is considered one of the greatest poets of all time, penning such classics as The Divine Comedy and Inferno. Here's his statue in Verona we showed you earlier. In fact, 21 generations later, the descendants still own this beautiful sprawling 247-acre estate, and we Uniwell guests had the privilege of having lunch here, accompanied, of course, with generous pours of the estate's most well-regarded wines.
Oh my, after all that, the tour passed us by in a bit of a blur, but nonetheless, we were very impressed with this excursion. The lunch was absolutely superb, and the wines, well, the hosts left the bottles on the table for us to help ourselves. Wonderful wines. Very bad idea. If someone says to you, there's not really much to do in Venice, then point them to this video series. If someone says to you, there's no such thing as a river cruise around Venice, also tell them politely to watch these videos. You see, this voyage is absolutely bursting with incredible excursions, genuine jaw drop moments, and more Italian food and wine than you will find on any other cruise. What are the downsides? Oh, well, only one. You have to leave and go home. Congratulations, you've made it to the end, but please continue your journey with us by watching one of these. Thank you.